to that first, okay? I just wanted to go. I got you, baby. I feel mm -hmm. it. In you. This is my ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. We're here. Well, I'm really glad to be here in person, right here in front of you. Um, you know what? We in this uh, in this panel, we don't groan and bemoan the destructive narratives about us misrepresenting who we are and how we are. This panel will help us to reconstruct, to tell our own stories, the real deal, our stories. This is our story. This is our song. Um, let the work I've done speak for me. And so to moderate this panel on reconstructing the historical narrative of us is uh, Professor Kamozi Woodard, who was given, I don't know if he'll tell you this, but his name was given him by Amir Baraka, if I'm not, if I'm correct. That's right, yeah. Yes. He is um, the Esther Rauschenbusch Professor of History, Public Policy, and Africana Studies at Sarah Lawrence College, a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania. Um, served on the board of directors of the Urban History Association, edited Amir Baraka's Black Newark and Unity of the Struggle, Newspapers, Children Express, and the Man Trend, as well as Black Art Mo Movement. Uh, you can read the rest of this. He's just too much. Please welcome the moderator for today, Professor Kamozi Woodard. Thank you. It's good to see all you out here today. Uh, I'm Kamozi Woodard from uh, Sarah Lawrence College these days, but originally I'm a, I was from a school called Amity Baraka, which if anybody knew Amity Baraka knew that was an institution in itself. Uh, today we're going to have a conversation about constructing the historical narrative, and our panelists are Jeffrey Allen, Ayana Mathis, and uh, Leonard Pitts. Without further ado, we're going to uh, start it off. You know, I wanted to start it out with, uh, not too long ago, in Gugi Wathiango, the uh, Kenyan novelist wrote uh, something torn and new. And he was talking about this issue of remembering. And, uh, you know, so history and remembering. And uh, the fact that colonialism and slavery obliterate the memory of the oppressed people. And so much of literature and writing is about putting that body back together, remembering or reconstituting the body. Um, and maybe we'll launch into that discussion. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to ask you first, as you're addressing that question, to say something about something you've written on this theme. And maybe we could start at the end with, uh, and come this way. Thank well, thank you. Um, so uh, to answer that question, I have a, I have a novel, that, novel that's coming out in a couple of months, um, which is called Song of the Shank, and it's uh, loosely based on a real person. Um, his uh, name was Thomas Green Wiggins. Uh, he was born a slave in Georgia in 1849, and um, he became this um, famous pianist and musician. He was the first African American to play at the White House, and I believe that was in around 1857. Um, essentially, he was a celebrity in his own time uh, from the 1850s until the 1880s. And so, um, I, uh, you know, I had never heard of him. I sort of stumbled upon his story. Um, I was reading a, a, a book by the writer Oliver Sacks, who, um, and in this one particular chapter, he talks about Blind Tom as an example of an autistic savant. Um, and uh, in any case, uh, I was surprised to discover that there had been this um, really well-known African-American pianist and composer, uh, and, um, and also just uh, some of the phenomenal aspects of the, of, you know, of the things about his music that were very surprising. But uh, essentially, he's been written out of history, in part because uh, because he's carried his label of the autistic savant. And um, uh, musicologists, you know, believe that for that reason, he was not truly creative. On the other hand, um, he is a problematic figure for African American historians in the sense that uh, Blind Tom, you know, was owned by. Um, 
a white slave master, and uh, among other things, Tom gave uh, concerts that benefited the Confederate cause, right? So he's a problematic figure for, in that respect. Uh, so in, in any case- um, is, it, is it true that they didn't let Tom know that slavery was over? <laughs> well, I mean, I think- or Did somebody make that up? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they probably did. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I think those are, those are kind of interesting questions just about, you know, to, to what degree was he aware of, uh, aware of his situation? To what degree, uh, you know, did he willingly participate, you know, in this? And, or maybe, you know, to what degree did he, ha did he did, you know, uh, did he lack options, you know, being a blind person? Is it true he had memorized, is it hundreds or thousands of songs? Yeah, they claimed he, you know, the, the story is that uh, he had a musical memory of, of, of like 5,000 compositions or something, mm -hmm. which was, you know, uh, in the range of a Mozart or someone of the But he, time. it is not true he could actually play uh, the piano with the back of his hand, is it? Uh, Baraka put that in a poem one time. I was <laughs> wondering about that. Yeah, in fact, it's interesting because Baraka, there, there's a guy who did a recording of some of Blind Tom's compositions, and Baraka wrote, uh, wrote the linear notes. notes for that. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, he did all kinds of things. Like he would play, th he could play three songs at once, you know, mm -hmm. he, in different keys. And, um, you know, he was like a 19th century Jimi Hendrix or somebody, you know. So it, it was just really, made, that was sort of the thing that was one of the things that drew me to uh, his story. Um, but, you know, the other thing I would say too, like in trying to figure out how to tell the story, I began to think about other, you know, the larger question of the story of slavery in America. And, um, and one of the, one of the really, uh, one of the, the linchpins of, of, of my novel becomes the, uh, the draft riots in New York City in 1863, which, you know, uh, as far as I know, it's still the, the, you know, the worst example of race riots in America, but very few of us know anything about it, you know. So, um, so that becomes sort of the central uh, piece of the backstory in the novel, whereas other things happen, you know, around that. So, um, so you know, so part of the part of my project in the novel, among other things, was to bring uh, Tom's story, you know, to put Tom's story back on the front page, so to speak, but also to you know, to point to um, aspects of, of slavery, uh, such as the draft riots, and that we don't necessarily remember anymore. You know? So, is there a counter master narrative that you're taking aim at as you as you write your narrative? Well, I think the I think in, in the, the very specifics of Tom's life, um, I'm taking aim at this notion that he was uh, simply, you know. Um, uh, well, what with this, you know, that he was simply brainwashed. Like in one one of the articles I read said something like, you know, uh, it, you know, it, it, the author said, you know, Tom was fortunate because his blindness and his idiocy didn't let him know, <laughs> didn't let him know that he was both black and a slave, something like that, you know, in very condescending terms. So I, I began to think, you know, maybe there's a, there's another way. Of thinking about his story, you know, and so, um, and maybe within the parameters of his life, he he was resisting, you know, his situation in the only way that he could, and you know, one of the surprising things about him was that at a certain point, you know, his career ended because he simply refused to go on stage and play, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and um, you know, so that said a lot to me. And there's there's kind of the silence around his life, but like certain things he did seem to speak volumes about who he might have been, you know, but it's all speculation, of course, on my well, part. What did you think of the CD, though, the music? You, you, you saw that. Right? Uh, <laughs> oh, honestly, music was a little disappointing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but no, I mean, uh, I think I think because we don't have any of uh, any I guess of those time. are his own compositions. That right, those are his compositions. So he did, you know, he had, uh, he, I think he penned like 500 compositions, but, um, but well, we don't really have, uh, you know, we don't have any recordings of what, of what his performances were like. So fr mm. from the descriptions of his performances, you know, certainly the, his performances went beyond, well beyond what the sheet music is. So I think that's something that's lacking. But, you know, there's, there's no way we can really know what that is because we don't have any, you know.